I'd like to thank everyone for coming here to the uh, Open Storage Summit. Uh, many, as many of you may know, my name is Bill Moore. I worked on uh, the original team for ZFS for a number of years and have spent some time in the storage industry. I was the first non-founder at 3PAR, which was recently acquired by Dell. I mean HP, no wait, Dell. Oh yeah, HP. And uh, that was uh, quite a lot of fun and returned to Sun after that little adventure to uh, work on ZFS. And now I'm off uh, doing a new company doing, well, guess what? Storage. So. I uh, thought I'd share with you some of the thoughts that I've been having on the storage industry as a whole. And um, just to make sure we're all on the same page and give everyone sort of the same vocabulary that I'll be using later on, just wanted to go over some quick things in the industry. And um, you can think of really any storage system as a recipe of several ingredients. Everything from the CPU, you have your volatile, your non-volatile storage, the way they're all connected together, the protocols that speaks inside the box, outside the box. But um, these are the basic things that you get to work with when building a storage subsystem. So everyone's favorite, of course, is typically the CPU. Interesting things about CPUs over the last, you know, several years is that the go-go 90s megahertz clock race is kind of not going anywhere anymore. The clock rate's pretty much stagnated. Um, there is a the thing, a little side note here, is in the Solaris kernel group, we used to have every year something called Predictoria, where we'd make one, three, and five-year predictions, both on Sun and in the future. And back in 2004, I made the prediction at the time that no, you know, volume commodity shipping CPU is going to exceed five gigahertz in the next five years. And of course, at the time, people were like, ha, 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 that's funny. No way. You know, you're wrong. And that was six years ago. And I'd be willing to renew it for another five years because it's the, uh, as they made fun of me at the time, they said, oh, that's the other Moore's law, the one that's going to, you know, fall real soon now. But seems the clock rate really has stagnated. It really hasn't gotten past, you know, the low to mid three gigahertz and instead, the designers said, boy, what do we do with all these transistors? Rather than slinging a clock up and down as fast as we can, how about we have many, many more processors on the same die? So parallelism is sort of the new megahertz race. How many cores can I fit on a single die? Well, time will tell on that one. And to make things even more interesting, the CPU designers put in all sorts of interesting special instructions for doing your favorite CPU intensive task of the day, whether it's encryption or half calculation, compression, what have you, all sorts of special instructions there to make your life a happy one. Uh, including for the people that want to do uh, rate, you know, double, triple parity rate calculations, Galois field multiply instructions. Um, the other thing that is an ingredient in storage systems is RPAL volatile memory, or DRAM. The interesting thing about DRAM, though, is that it's about 300 instructions away from the CPU on a good day. So what this means is if you're... Um, waiting on a memory miss and the CPU is sitting there, you know, figuratively speaking, picking its nose, it uh, could be executing about 300 instructions instead of sitting there waiting on memory. So for all you guys out there doing performance tuning, if you can do something in a couple hundred instructions, it saves you memory access, usually ahead of the game for doing that. The capacity growth, of course, because it's a silicon process, roughly follows Moore's law. Lately, I think it's been lagging a little bit behind that, but it's still roughly there. The cost is dropping ever lower before you know, it's hundreds of dollars per gig. Now it's dropping down over the next year. People expect it to drop down below a dollar per gigabit, which, you know, you can roughly figure that as being $10 a gigabyte. But at the end of the day, DRAM is still volatile. You lose power, stop refreshing it, poof, all your contents are gone. And the other thing is that it's surprisingly power hungry. Uh, typical DIM these days is on the order of, you know, 10, 12 watts, which means that your CPU, which is going to consume, say, 95 watts, or for your extreme edition, you know, 120, 130 watts, you have eight DIMs on there, all of a sudden, you're using about as much power to, you know, have your memory on the system as you are to power that super fast mega expensive CPU. So nobody's going to be building, you know, multi, you know, 100 terabyte DRAM based storage systems anytime soon because that would just be multiple kilowatts of power. It's just prohibitive. Um, that 
brings us to our favorite friend, non-volatile memory. And of course, non-volatile memory comes in memory forms, in many forms. Our um, favorite friend, the disk drive, uh, NAND flash, which is the, relatively speaking for the storage folks here, the new kid on the block. Um, it's um, off-color, half-cousin, nor flash. And phase change memory, which is becoming ever more popular, but still, Optimistic projections say that in five years it'll reach parity with DRAM in terms of pricing. So again, I don't think anyone, because of cost, is going to be building large-scale phase change memory storage systems anytime soon. And of course, there's you know the nebulous future, which includes an alphabet soup of all your favorite technologies. And all of these technologies are looking at like 2014 as the earliest that they would enter production in the marketplace, and that's entering the market. The same same way phase changes, quote, entered the market this year. So volume shipments and cost per gigabyte being in line with other technologies is way, way, way long away. So we're stuck with our pals Disk and NAND for quite some time here. Disk trends, of course, one of my favorite topics is that you obviously see higher capacities per drive all the time. Western Digital has their three terabyte drive that they announced recently. By the end of the year, people expect to see four terabyte drives, so the capacity is ever increasing. However, if you think about it, the way disk drive stores stuff on the surface of a platter, any time you double the capacity, you double the aerial density. How many bits can I stuff in a given unit of space? And the interesting thing about that is if I double the number of bits that I can fit in a given space, the linear transfer speed, in other words, the uh, distance along one axis or the number of bits along one axis, only increases by the square root of two, so roughly 40%. So doubling in capacity means that on a good day, you've gotten a 40% increase in your maximum transfer rate. Um, and of course, all of this is very interesting, and three and a half inch drives are still very popular, but because they're getting up to four terabytes now and you know bigger in the future, the need for such capacity is you know uh, somewhat diminished on a per volume on a volume shipment basis. So two and a half inch drives are starting to become a well accepted industry standard in terms of the form factor here. Uh, disk, of course, comes with a lot of limitations. Rotational speed is limited um, by physics, and there are really two main components of this. One is the outer rim of the drive has to remain subsonic, so it has to rotate past the read-write head below the speed of sound. Otherwise, all the aerodynamics that they've you know, spent um, on their read-write head to get it as close to the platter to increase that aerial density just doesn't work anymore. You know, Chuck Yeager had some interesting experiences, I'm sure, breaking the speed of sound way back then, and the disk drive industry has uh, not yet faced those. The other part of the physics problem that um, keeps the rotational speed from increasing arbitrarily is just the material strength itself. You spin something that fast, you have an awesome centrifugal force trying to tear the actual medium itself apart. So the medium has to be able to withstand that. And because of this, rotational speed really isn't going anytime, going anywhere anytime soon. Um, IOPS, of course, the number of IOPS you do per second are dominated by this rotational latency. On a 7200 RPM drive, it's about 8 milliseconds to do a full revolution on the drive, which means that on average you're going to have to wait 4 milliseconds. So that 4 milliseconds really won't go anywhere. That's fundamentally how long you're going to have to wait on average for something to rotate under the read-write head, which means that disk drives, no matter how many bits you pack on these things, are going to be really bad just fundamentally at random IOPS. Going back to my little square root of two thing for transfer speed is that also applies on the time to populate a drive. You double the capacity, sure you get 40% better transfer speed, but it's also twice as big. So that's where the other square root of two goes in the doubling there is that it takes 40% longer to populate. And of course disk drives are relatively speaking power hungry, you know, anywhere from you know, 8 watts on your super green drives to, you know, 20 watts for your fancy 15k RPM super mega drives. And the, they're very fragile. Every person designing something with disk drives has to worry about vibration and cooling and shock and isolation. It's just a horrible, horrible place to spend your time. Um, NAND, of course, is the other component that's becoming ever more popular here in storage systems. It's uh, decreasing in cost, but the cost, the rate at which the cost decreases is actually slowing down. A lot of the improvements in silicon, you know, Flash has been sort of catching up with lithography and is pretty much caught up now. 
and uh, MLC, the transition from single level per cell to two bit per cell transition sort of happened silently while they were catching up with the lithography industry. And that just had been driving costs down at unsustainable levels. So now people predict that the cost is only going to decrease around 20, 30% a year um, on a per gigabyte basis. But the good news is that volume shipments are exploding. I can show you a bunch of graphs, but I'm sure you've all seen them. You know, it's your classic exponential curve. Everyone's going to want flash and everything all the time. So the amount of these things that people are making and selling are just going through the roof. Increasing density, of course, like I said, they're getting more and more um, bits on a single die. However, unlike most things, when you make it smaller, it's not getting more reliable and it's not getting any faster. It's actually getting much slower and the reliability is decreasing. As a matter of fact, uh, the triple, the three bit per cell, or TLC as they sometimes call it, NAND, is nearly unusable. You're getting error rates like one in every hundred or one in every ten bits. I mean, holy cow, that's like near unreliable or unacceptable. And also, going back to the uh, shrinkage of these things, the floating gates that are the fundamental building block of NAND are getting so small that it's no longer thousands of electrons sitting here on these floating gates. It's getting down to like hundreds. And that's not very much. A lot of bad things can happen. So the programming these uh, floating gates inside the NAND device is like kind of like using a jackhammer, but you can't do it when you're only managing 100 electrons, you have to be very gentle with that jackhammer. Push a few electrons on there, see, oh, did that go okay? Okay, well, I'll push a few more. Ah, okay, there we are, good. Because a few electrons are just a difficult thing to manipulate with a lot of precision currently. And that brings us to our NAND flash limitations. Is it, sure, you get a lot of IOPS out of a uh, NAND device, but not as many as you might think. The time to get to the first byte on uh, your standard MLC NAND is like on the order of 80 microseconds. Add another 20 microseconds for transferring that 4K page of yours, and you've got 100 microseconds to do essentially a 4K IOPS. That gives you, what, 10,000 of these per second? Sounds great. What about writes, though? Writes take, say, a program time of more like one and a half milliseconds on the next generation NAND devices. That's a lot less. That means if I'm programming 4K pages as fast as I can, I'm getting about two and a half megabytes a second out of a single NAND chip. Not a lot. Add to that that you got your five millisecond erase times, which is worse than a disk drive. Good thing is you can hide those behind, um, you know, pre-erase and all sorts of other algorithms. But the uh, good news on this is that while the per element, uh, per NAND uh, die, essentially, performance may not sound as great as you think, there are an awful lot of them. To get to a terabyte currently, you need about 256 of these little NAND devices. So while single die performance may not be that great, in aggregate, you multiply these things out, all of a sudden you're talking good performance again. And we'll talk about what that means about concurrency a little bit later. The other thing is that they're, they wear out. Unlike you know, disk drives or DRAM or CPU caches, the more you program and erase NAND devices, the quicker they wear out. And your typical MLC devices these days are rated like on the order of three to 5,000 program erase cycles. And actually, it's kind of interesting because you would think, okay, as I near that three, 5,000 number, I'm gonna get more good error rates, things are gonna go down. But it's actually kind of surprising. Someone ran an experiment lately where they decided, all right, I'm going to run this test. I got a device rated at 3,000 program erase cycles. I'm just going to erase it, program it, read it, erase it, program it, read it, see how long this takes. And he got up to like 50,000 uh, program erase cycles and was still getting back near perfect data. And he's like, did I write my test right? Let me go. Yeah, I wrote it right. What the heck's going on here? And as it turns out, the program and then reading back of the data immediately isn't the problem. It's the sitting around for a little while or the read disturbance problem that actually um, gets exacerbated as the device wears out. So when he modified his test to say, all right, I'm going to erase it, program it, read back the data. But instead of reading it back once, I'm going to read it back a few hundred times and see what happens. Early in the device's life, it was great, reasonable bit error rates, just like the manufacturer suggested. As he got near you know, the um, specified duration of the device, he started to see more and more error rates. So when we get back up to that 50,000 number, it's like now he reads the same page 10 times, all of a sudden, huge number of bit error rates. So the read disturbance problem is really the one that um, gets exacerbated as the device gets worn out.